Coming up, a visit with space-obsessed entrepreneur Joe Edwards, who reveals how he got the elusive Neil Armstrong to pose for a picture. He usually has his back to the audience, but the St. Louis Symphony Orchestra's new music director promises to be a familiar face and voice to St. Louis concert goers. I love when people just come and feel that I am accessible and that they can just share what they like, what they didn't like. And 75 years ago, a Missouri native was leading American troops after D-Day. But even though there are so few still alive who were there, the story of Moberly's Omar Bradley is worth remembering. I have never known any way that was so well loved. He was a soldier general. It's all next on Living St. Louis. I'm Jim Kircher, and there was a period in the 20th century between the wars that was the golden age of aviation. And a lot of kids back then were obsessed with airplanes. They were building models. They knew the names of famous pilots like Charles Lindbergh, Amelia Earhart, Wiley Post. But their kids, well, a lot of them became obsessed with space. And the names they knew were Shepard and Grissom and Glenn and Neil Armstrong. Well, with this summer's 50th anniversary of the moon landing, Paul Shankman decided to visit one of those space-obsessed kids who's become a space-obsessed adult. Ignition sequence start. Six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. It's a little bit warm inside here. That's why I'd like to open it up at times. Like that, and let the air in. Joe Edwards, the man known for giving St. Louis the stars, also gave it the moon. I thought, well, I'm going to call it Moonrise. Moon, I've always loved, and then rise is a positive word, so Moonrise. I think everybody is enamored by the moon, and you see it just about every day, uh, whether you think about it all the time or not, but you see it. So I figured, well, that'd be a good piece of advertising, free. 2019, the 50th anniversary of the moon landing, is also the 10th anniversary of the Moonrise Hotel. And even though Edwards' attention lately has been focused on terrestrial travel, he has had a lifelong fascination with space travel, especially the voyage of Apollo 11. T minus one minute, 54 seconds and counting. We are go. I was in awe of it when it happened. We have a liftoff, 32 minutes past the hour. Liftoff on Apollo 11. Just sat on the floor and just watched this, this TV, just closed the curtains and uh, didn't move for a few hours. As the owner of the Moonrise, Edwards has assigned himself the job of curating the hotel's collection of lunar knickknacks. Several of the items in this case I bought through the years through different space auctions when people would uh, donate their own items to sell them or, or their families did after they might have passed away. That's the metal bank I had as a kid growing up when I was about four or five years old where you put a penny on that and lower it and then press the red button, shoots it up into the rocket ship bank. This is a liquor bottle type of thing. There are other ones that are perfume uh, types just kind of fun putting them all together. Of all Joe's lunar collectibles, there is one that eclipses the rest. It's so big he had to put it on the roof. During the design phase, I kept looking at the exterior and just kept looking at it for two months and it finally hit me. I'm calling it the Moonrise Hotel. By golly, I'm gonna build the world's largest man-made rotating moon and paint half of it in ivory colors of mountains and craters and the other half with grays and blacks and have it rotate 24 seven so kids or adults can look up and watch the moon go through its phases all the time. And since the roof of the hotel is made entirely of solar panels, here the sun powers the moon. The eagle has landed. Under the moon, there are 125 guest rooms featuring what you might call planetarium decor. Even the treats in the dog bowl at the front desk are heavenly. 
One of my automobiles I like the moon so much is the license plate says moon. I couldn't resist. What is this thing? Well, it's a sculptural piece that I commissioned from a St. Louis artist, Bill Chrisman. I wanted a robot built, but I wanted it to be warm and not all tin and metals. So this part of it is a radio cabinet, really nice grains of wood and all with that warm feel. Even in the wintertime, it feels like a nice robot. The most expensive item in the hotel's mini museum is this mission patch, one of several extras carried to the moon and back by the crew of Apollo 11. That's just a, a joy having that here to let people see something that went to the moon the very, very first time. The most personal item in the collection is this picture of Joe Edwards meeting Neil Armstrong, the first man to walk on the moon. Boy, look at those pictures. Edwards traveled to Dayton, Ohio on a hunch. Armstrong might be making a rare public appearance at a banquet honoring the memory of one of his old flying buddies. I went there an hour early and the hotel people were still vacuuming and getting ready, the room ready and all, and just hung around. And then sure enough, off the elevator comes Neil Armstrong just by himself walking in. And so I walked up, we got a drink and, and talked until all the admirals and all interrupted us after a while because they were all just, oh my gosh, it's Neil Armstrong. This is Houston or Roger Neil. For most people, it's hard to still get excited about something that happened 50 years ago. But when it comes to the voyage of Apollo 11, Joe Edwards is still over the moon. Wow, that accomplishment was amazing. Back in 1969, that's just incredible that they were able to pull that off. And it wasn't just getting the moon, but all the technology that came out of that program in all sorts of other areas. That's one reason we're such a very rich country, because of that. So I think we need to get back into science again and do something big and we'll keep getting better and better. Amazing what people can do if they work together. Duh, rest of the world, let's all work together. To the moon! Well, there's a foot on the moon, stepping down on the moon. There was another big anniversary this year, the 75th anniversary of the Normandy invasion, D-Day. But of course, it wasn't just a day. It was the start of a very long and costly campaign that would lead to victory in Europe in World War II. We know that because we know how it all turned out. But 75 years ago in July of 1944, Allied troops were just taking control of key towns in Normandy, preparing for the push to Berlin that no one knew how long would take or at what cost. But one thing most people did know was the name Omar Bradley the American general who rose from humble beginnings in Moberly, Missouri. On June 6, 1944, D-Day, General Omar Bradley was on board one of the 5,000 Allied ships in the channel. He had helped plan this invasion, and his job would be to command all American ground forces as they pushed into France. During the war, Bradley was often just one of the generals in the background. He didn't get the kind of attention that Supreme Allied Commander Dwight Eisenhower got. And more colorful figures like General George Patton or Britain's Field Marshal Montgomery made better stories. But Eisenhower once told war correspondent Ernie Pyle to go and discover Bradley, the man who would become known simply as the Soldier's General. On the morning of D-Day, Bradley made a point of putting on a pair of combat boots made at the Brown Shoe Factory in his hometown of Moberly, Missouri. In 2007, we went to Moberly to find out more about Omar Bradley and about those who were working to honor his memory. He never left his boyhood behind. He loved Moberly, and I started hearing stories from military people. Carolee Hazlett spent five you know, years heading up the effort that, to build uh, this memorial in Moberly's uh, City uh, Park, unveiled in 1996. It started out as another civic uh, project, but every, when she started asking for contributions, uh, veteran, she began to realize veteran, that veteran, this was more than a hometown hero. It started pouring in. Uh, military leaders from all over started getting in touch with me when they found out that we were doing a Bradley Memorial because he was so well loved. 
Moberly is in Randolph County, about 30 miles north of Columbia, and Omar Bradley returned here periodically throughout his life. But he had grown up in rural Randolph County. His father was a country school teacher and part-time farmer, and Omar grew up poor but well-read, a good shot and a good athlete. When his father died, he and his mother moved to Moberly, something of a railroad boomtown in 1908. They lived in this house on South 4th Street, where they took in boarders. Across the street lived Mary Quayle, the girl who would become his wife, but they didn't really date in high school. As the new kid in town, he never socially quite fit in. But he did win respect on the baseball diamond. The Moberly High School yearbook called him a good ball player, even if he doesn't look like one. His athletic skills would also serve him well at West Point. But he'd only applied because he heard it was free, and another area student had already been appointed. Both took the entrance exam at Jefferson Barracks in St. Louis. The other student failed, Omar passed, and he went to the academy. West Point, class of 1915. One of his classmates was Dwight Eisenhower. In fact, there were so many future generals, it was later called the class the stars fell on. A few years after graduation, America entered World War I, led by Black Jack Pershing, who had grown up just 50 miles from Bradley's hometown. But Omar Bradley wasn't here in France. He spent the war stationed in the U.S. Certain now that his military career would go nowhere without the battlefield experience his classmates were getting. There was little in those early years that foreshadowed the key role the young officer from Missouri would play in the next war. Well, yes. Uh, it's a story told in an exhibit at the Randolph County off. Historical yeah. Society in Moberly. You got a favorite picture? Or you got a favorite uh, art, uh, well, I like, artifact? Well, I like seeing uh, the ones with uh, some of the big uh, dogs, uh, you might right. say, of the Second World War. This is... Uh, Historical yeah, Society right. President Carl Rice has also heard plenty of stories about Bradley from veterans who have right. stopped in over the years. Uh, the little stories that you get, you know, he came by our regiment or whatever, ask us questions about if we're getting enough to eat and baths and stuff like that. So the ones that knew about him, they're, they're still um, remembering him as the GI's general. Mm -hmm. Montgomery. Montgomery and uh, Collins. And the, uh, Wilbur the, Cruz uh, of Granite that's City that's got a like closer there. look at the no, famous generals than most GIs in the, in the European uh, War. He was a jeep driver for an officer uh, and Jewish often found himself on the edge yeah, of some yeah. big meetings, exchanging down, stories uh, with the other drivers. Nobody liked Montgomery. Nobody. Patton, I, I, I saw him in that, but then the stories, I think, I think he lives up to the stories that we got because of uh, just the way he acted, you know, swagger that he had. And Bradley, maybe a little less flamboyant. Huh? Yes, he was a rather quiet man, I, I would say, and he circulated, as far as I know, he circulated in the group and got the job done, but there was no fanfare like with Patton. Norbert Bussman was a first lieutenant who served in North Africa and Italy. It took men like him as well as guys like Patton to win a war. <laughs> Patton was exciting, dynamic. Bradley was a steady as you go and uh, obviously a very brilliant general. Bradley didn't start the war as one of the top generals. He earned those promotions on the battlefields. He served under George Patton in North Africa and the taking of Sicily. But by D-Day, Patton was serving under Bradley, who now commanded the American ground troops in northern France. Generals Eisenhower and Bradley had been planning an all-out assault. General Patton, specialist in mechanized warfare, had his armored divisions ready. The weight of this offensive carried the American troops across the Breton Peninsula in four days. As in any battle, there were good decisions and bad decisions. And Bradley admitted he had not adequately planned for the obstacles his troops encountered in the French countryside. Did you ever fight your way through hedgerows? They're about six feet wide and five feet high. Centuries of packing have made them hard as cement. Then a sergeant came up with a great idea, a hedge cutter. 
When they told General Bradley about it, he drove 60 miles to have a look and slapped top secret on it. Bradley was criticized by Patton and by Montgomery as not being bold, aggressive enough in the battlefield. Bradley and others disagreed. He was proud of his tactical abilities, and especially of the fact that he was not reckless when it came to the lives of his men. Omar Bradley wrote that when he heard that Germany had surrendered and the war in Europe was over, he thanked God for the victory, but could not sleep. Haunted, he said, by all the men whose lives had been lost. After the war, Eisenhower and Bradley remained popular figures. Bradley first took over the Veterans Administration, and then, as Eisenhower considered his political future, President Truman named Bradley the Army's top general and the first chairman of the new Joint Chiefs of Staff. He served in the early days of the Cold War and the Korean War, retiring in 1953. But five-star generals never, technically, are out of the service. And in 1974, he was back in uniform, back at Normandy, for the 30th anniversary of D-Day. There were also some visits back home to Moberly, parades and speeches, and lunch at an old downtown diner. Omar Bradley died in 1981 at the age of 88. Fifteen years later, Carol Lee Hazlett found out just how alive the memories of him still were. I still get contributions. I have an old uh, fellow that served under him, that lives in Independence. Every three months he sends me a big contribution to help maintain the memorial. Uh, I have never known any way that was so well loved. He was a soldier general. A few years after our visit, Carolee Hazlett said she was concerned that the story of Omar Bradley was fading. So few of the veterans who had been staying in touch with her were still alive. But now she says she's a bit more hopeful. The community is getting involved. The Moberly Parks Board, the VFW, the high schools, Junior ROTC. So yes, she says she does think Omar Bradley will be known to coming generations. Finally, for this next story, I was looking up the meaning of the word maestro. It's Italian for master or teacher. The feminine is maestra, the plural is maestri. Well, after all of that, when I sit down with the new music director for the St. Louis Symphony Orchestra, he says, just call me Stefan. We met with the Frenchman, whose hairstyle is befitting okay, an orchestra conductor. Yes. After all, they don't call it long hair music for nothing. We sat on stage at Powell Hall with the brand new Steinway Grand Piano as a background. And I did wonder if I'd have the temerity to ask if I could play it. Maybe, maybe not. After all, conductors, great artists, they sometimes have the reputation of being temperamental. But Denev wants people to see him and the symphony's music as anything but intimidating. I don't look for fame, but I, uh, I love when people just come and feel that I am accessible and that they can just share what they like, what they didn't like. So and Stefan's uh, okay? I don't have to call you maestro? You can definitely call me Stefan. Okay. Everybody can, <laughs> of course. No, I, I, I give you one example. Uh, yesterday I had to uh, trim my beard, so uh, I went to a barber shop to meet town barber for the first time, and they didn't know who I am. I arrived there, and there was such a good mood. People were happy, there were good music, they were kind of dancing and walking at the same time, and we had such a good laugh uh, that actually they even asked me, they noticed I had an accent, and uh, they thought I was a foreigner, etc. And without knowing really at the start who I was, then we, we just had so much fun. They, they were happy that I was visiting St. Louis. They asked me to sign the wall. And I thought, okay, this is really St. Louis. This is warm, this is, you know, this kind of um, feeling that uh, you can be included and uh, I feel already a part of the community. He is also one of those conductors who likes to talk to the audience about the music they're about to hear. I love indeed to uh, speak to the audience because a conductor, of course, very soon show only his back, he or her back, to the audience. A key for me is that 
a concert is accessible, that we include everybody, whatever your background is, and nobody should be actually intimidated by a concert hall. Uh, it's actually really an experience we feel together. At this concert that aired on the Nine Network's Night at the Symphony, Deneuve was still guest conductor, but everybody knew he had been named the next music director. So he decided to have a little fun with the audience. My name is Stéphane Deneuve, and this is my eighth visit to St. Louis. And it is also my very last visit as guest conductor. <laughs> Deneuve grew up in a small town in France, and our new music director will be featuring French composers. But for the people who uh, maybe like less the French music, I say, don't worry, <laughs> because I like everything. And as music director, I will bring every repertoire, not only French, of course. Uh, I will bring, like, next, like this season, um, you'll have Beethoven 9, Mahler's Second Symphony, Shostakovich 10, Rite of Spring of Stravinsky, I mean, just uh, everything. But he's aware of St. Louis's but French heritage and kept that in mind when he put together the upcoming uh, season. To, uh, and I wanted to uh, create an arch between the two cultures, the French and American culture, and offer pieces from the French repertoire that has been influenced by American culture and American pieces that have been influenced by French style, just in order to show that music has a great power, is to make bridges between actually different cultures and that we all feel together. He will also bring to St. Louis audiences music from contemporary composers, but he doesn't want you to jump to any conclusions about what that means. And they think, well, I'm going to have to sit through this to get to the Rachmaninoff because we're going to be force-fed something that I'm not going to get, but I'll sit through it. You've heard this before, I know, and it does happen, I think, sometimes. Look, uh, I try to be brief, even if this subject is something very, very uh, important for me, and I would speak about that for hours, but yes, we have to recognize it. After the Second World War, there has been a fairly long time where new music meant something very dissonant, very difficult to understand, very sometimes atonal, which means that without uh, melodies and without uh, clear harmonies. And this has really put off a lot of audience and this has created the cliche that modern music, even music which is now 70 years old, would be something that is like a bad pill to swallow before you hear indeed the, the tune of Dvorak and Tchaikovsky, etc. Now you've said even musicians sometimes felt that way. Of course, and we have to recognize that, yes, there has been some dead end in what is so-called the modernity, but I'm passionate to tell you the good news is that this world has changed totally. I will always try to find the creme de la creme of the new music that can please the musicians, that can please the audience, and that they really can enjoy it in an emotional way, and that they start to all recognize that there are great new pieces written today and that you can enjoy this new music as you enjoy the big, 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 very famous pieces of the core repertoire. So I think there is really a, a cliche to change and it is my big mission to uh, change it all over the world uh, modestly. Of course, many of my colleagues do that. So to just select the right piece of music that could stand the test of time and become the repertoire of the future. Conductors don't have just one job, and you really need to go to his website to see everything that Deneuve is up to, appearances around the world. He remains the principal guest conductor for the Philadelphia Orchestra, and he is the music director for the Philharmonic Orchestra in Brussels, where his wife and daughter still live. But European orchestras are state-supported. Like other American orchestras, St. Louis's has to raise its own money. Uh, at first, when I arrived here a long time ago as a guest conductor, I thought that this was, of course, uh, difficult because then you had only to please the people and there was this tension and it was very unstable. You didn't have funding for years and years like it is in Europe. But I realized this is a great opportunity to know for who you do music and to know why you do music and to interact with the people that make all of that possible. I really like indeed to be a uh, music director in this city especially because you really feel that it counts, that it is 
a very important big institution and it is the center of the city and uh, uh, and I feel I can make a difference. I can really bring my ideas, I can meet people. Um, I really feel I'm now part of uh, this wonderful town and its communities. Well, I'd say welcome back to St. Louis, but you've been here so many times. Uh, must feel like home? It does feel like my musical home. It is my home. Yeah, and it's a beautiful home. What do you think of uh, Pau Al? Well, it is magic and it's a big part of the equation for me because, you know, the instrument of the orchestra is the whole. And uh, we are so lucky here. It's very famous to be one of the best acoustic in the country and worldwide. It's, look, we are on stage. We hear each other so well and you can feel the sound is just going and it's generously going to every seat in the hall. There's no bad seats in this hall. It's fabulous. So now the piano. Yes, he said, go ahead and give our brand new Steinway a try. My Powell Symphony Hall debut was a quick rendition of the classic American composition, Paddlin' Madeline Home. Deneb's first concert as music director will be the free concert in September in Forest Park. You can expect we all might be having some fun with that. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. And that's Living St. Louis. Thanks for joining us. I'm Jim Kircher, and we'll see you next time. Living St. Louis is made possible by the support of the Mary Rankin Jordan and Eddie A. Jordan Charitable Foundation and by the members of Nine Network.